And so finally, I just kind of had this talk with myself of, so don't get it all. Yeah. You know, it's like if you go to a feast and you don't get to eat everything, it doesn't mean you don't go to the feast. You know? <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so yeah. so I've been I've been listening to, to these and no, I don't get it all, but his his points are so deep mm-hmm. that it just makes you sit back. I've sat back before and paused it. everyone, J.D. Silver here, and I had the pleasure of interviewing Michigan Piper tonight. And uh, so we're just having some smokes and connecting and getting to know each other. Doug, why don't you start it off and tell us what you're smoking? Sure. Uh, I am smoking Carter Hall, uh, my kind of my, my base go-to tobacco. And uh, in it, I'm smoking, uh, or should I say, I'm smoking in, try it again, <laughs> I am smoking my crescent bent crescent um that i got on a on a giveaway and i can't remember the gentleman's name that gave it away uh super nice guy uh but uh yeah just been a really good pipe to me so one of my favorites that's a pretty pipe can you hold it up again sure the camera there yeah it's a real thick wall and uh really enjoy this one your voice broke up there when you said it's really thick and then i didn't hear after that yeah, really thick walled. Uh, uh, the walls on it are really thick, so yeah. that shows a better picture of it or not. But uh, yeah. really like the really like how thick it is, how how robust it is. And I don't I don't even know what you would call that. It's not quite a bent brandy. It's like a half bent. But yeah, uh, right. Yeah, just just really good, really good pipe. And you know, he didn't like it because it gurgled. Uh, yeah. And I don't really have a whole a bad problem with gurgling. So I just send him down. I mean, I'll take it. <laughs> oh, nice, cool. Well, I have two pipes that I'm planning on smoking tonight. One is this kind of pitiful looking bulldog. And I was just trying to clean it up a little bit before we got together. And the other one is this pot that uh, I was given by a pastor friend. So uh, to start off, I'm smoking Sir Walter Raleigh, which was a gift from James Stumbo about three weeks ago or something. I couldn't believe that I actually won something. It was kind of cool. Do you ever go into James Stumbo's uh, live family things? I'm not. I don't hit a whole lot of lives. Um, I do hit some. Uh, but uh, I just, with my schedule, you know, it's kind of usually they're not, they're not going on when I'm available. You know, usually my availab- availability time is around about four o'clock when I get off work, you know, and I have like an hour before my wife gets home and then it's, you know, right back to it, whether it's eating dinner or, or whatnot. Right. So right. I try to get uh, Nathan's uh, from let my camera go. I try to hit his uh, prayer meeting every once in a while. The problem is I got meetings on Monday nights. So it's not always, doesn't always happen. Yeah. I like that one too. I've tuned in with that a few times. I, because I teach in the evenings, it's hard for me to be available Monday and Tuesdays. So, uh, yeah. But, so how long have you been smoking a pipe, Doug? Uh, not long. Uh, where are we at? I think I think it was, it was around November, December of 20, wow. I think. Well, um, yeah, it's over a year. What got you started? Like, why did you decide to, to smoke a pipe? Well, I was vaping, um, and I started vaping not not because I wanted to vape, but because I wanted to smoke a pipe. And there's a whole niche out there of uh, vaping pipe or pipers. There's custom pipes that you can get. Just a uh, real good community, just like the YTPC, just a lot smaller. And uh, as a matter of fact, Mick, uh, Aussie E Piper. I don't know if you ever saw his stuff, but he was uh, he was also in that group and. Uh, you know, we, we kind of followed each other through the, the YouTube presentation thing. And and uh, it just it just wasn't I don't want to say it wasn't doing anything for me because I enjoyed it. But, you know, I, I wasn't much of a vapor. Uh, they did have tobacco flavored vape juices. OK, uh, but it was more it was more like what tobacco tastes like before you light it. Um, oh. And so there's a guy by the name of Pete from Pete's Pipecraft that 
uh, I was asking some questions about it, and before I know it, a package shows up in the mail, and it's some tobacco and a pipe, and you know, just typical YTPC, right? Right. And uh, so I, you know, I tried it out, and you know, stumbled like everybody else, but swore I was going to stick with it and figure it out, and here we are. No looking back, eh? Yeah, what is I love it. What does your wife think? Still learning though. She hates it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh she, no. Yeah. She hates it, but she understands it. So, uh, you know, it's it's nice that I have the room um, so that, you know, I'm not staking up the rest of the house for her. But she's always been a bloodhound. You know, I, I smoke cigarettes for probably 15 years or better. And, uh, you know, we always kind of go back and forth on that. But she's much more gracious when it comes to pipe smoking. Uh, she's much more understanding. You know, she's like, well, why don't you go have your pipe and I'll do this or whatever. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, she's she definitely doesn't like the like the smell. That's for sure. So if you compared, since you've smoked both cigarettes and pipes, and I haven't, tell me what you find. What is the big difference between them? You like pipe smoking better than cigarettes? Absolutely, every day of the week. Um, the biggest difference for me is pipe smoking or uh, cigarette smoking was almost out of necessity. Mm. Um, you know, I, the way I look at it is I I relax to have a pipe. I had a cigarette to relax. Mm. Uh, you know, I when I was smoking cigarettes, it was like I had to get that cigarette because I had to get that nicotine. I had it was a fix. And you know, with a pipe, it's like I, I'm looking for the flavor. I, I could care less about the nicotine. Matter of fact, I kind of steer clear of the the heavy nicotine blends. Um, and you know the cigarettes is and it was much much more expensive mm. uh and you know i was younger you know I, I haven't smoked now cigarettes for 10 years but uh you know it was i always have to i was always chasing it like you know i'd have a cigarette it was like man that cigarette was good no i want another one well the next one didn't taste as good mm. but then i'd have another one because i was trying to chase that taste and it just i don't get that with the pipe you know come down and you have a pipe and, and it tastes good and you contemplate stuff for a little while and watch some YTPC videos and then, you know, you're off again. Yeah. And it, if I had to sit down and go a week without it, it's not a big deal. I've known a couple guys who tried to quit cigarette smoking by starting to smoke a pipe. And usually they bailed after a little while. They just weren't getting the same fix from it or they weren't. So you can understand that. Like, does that make sense to you? Oh, absolutely. I, I think the biggest challenge challenge for me, because I don't know that I would have been able to quit cigarettes with a pipe. Um, the biggest challenge to me is you're inhaling with the cigarette. And I, my son and I were talking about it because he, he smokes on and off. And, uh, and I, it's like it's like having I don't mean to glorify cigarettes. This is not not the, the purpose of this, but it's, it's honestly like a hug on the inside. I mean, when you get a cigarette, it's that, that just relax and just almost like somebody giving you a hug. Mm. Um, and so to try to go to pipes from cigarettes, I'd be too tempted to inhale the pipe. You know what I mean? And uh, I have heard, though, that if you want to quit cigarettes and go to the pipe, the best way to do it is to smoke a cigarette first, then have a pipe, then have another cigarette. And then over time, don't have that first cigarette. And then... After you get used to that, they don't have the second cigarette. I don't know if there's any truth to it, but that's what I've heard. Well, that kind of makes sense, I suppose, especially if you start to realize that the pipe was your favorite part of the whole night, and you think, "Well, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to start with the pipe." I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. And that's the idea. I didn't bring a drink out of here. Out here. I wonder if I can get my lovely wife to bring me a drink. <laughs> you hear me, Joe? I'm actually drinking something. You feel like bringing me a drink? No, okay. Whatever you feel like. What do we have? How about bring me my scotch in a glass? Do you mind? Thanks, honey. Isn't that one wonderful having a wife that will look after you like that? How long have you been married? Uh, I think we celebrated 31 years this year. Uh, I'm sorry, we will celebrate 31 years this year. Oh, wow. You're up on me then. I thought you were younger yeah, than we got married. I'm 50. So we got yeah, married when I was 19, I think. Yeah, I'm 53, coming on 54, but we got married at 25, I think. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, we got married real young and real fast. It was kind of a 
kind of a rocky road there for a while, but we got it figured out. So interesting. By the way, I'm drinking. My lovely wife went and got me some Kalamazoo Stout. Oh, Kalamazoo, yeah. Michigan's about, about an hour from me. I've never had it before. And this is very good. I love stout. I had a Guinness on uh, on Sunday on Mother's Day. I don't drink enough. I, whenever I have it, I'm like, oh yeah, I love stout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm mean, you know Sam Adams Boston Lager or any stout, pretty much any day of the week. I'm I'm uh, I'm good with. Thanks, sweetheart. So I'm drinking. Johnny Walker. Black label. Nice. Black label. It's almost gone. Where is it? <laughs> Time for another bottle. Yeah, I guess so. I usually wait till somebody buys it for me as a gift. <laughs> Which isn't that often. I haven't gotten down that road yet of the scotch and the bourbons and the gins yet. I've been kind of stuck in the stout, so. Yeah. Mm, I love the real peaty. The real peaty uh, scotches, you know? It's just such a it. neat, smoky flavor. Mm. Hmm. So you've been a fireman for your whole career? Pretty much. Um, I mean, I had some odd jobs. I was in the military for a little while. And uh, when I got out, I, I think I spent like two or three years, you know, in the general uh, trades and then uh, got the job as a firefighter. I was a volunteer firefighter before that. And then uh, spent about... 14 years, just over 14 years as a, as a career firefighter before I got a job as a fire chief. And then I spent about six years at my first fire chief job. And now I've been to this one about a year and a half. Wow. What do you like about being a fire chief or a firefighter? Well, believe it or not, it's, it's like two totally different things. Um, ah. The uh, being, being a firefighter, I think the, the best thing about it is that you, you're there to help people. You're there to, you know, and it's not like, pardon the, pardon the phrase, but it's not like blowing smoke. Um, <laughs> it, you're, you're there to help. You're there to make somebody, the worst day of somebody's life better, you know, and there's a lot of gratification but by doing that. Uh, yeah. You know, being a fire chief, it kind of changes everything because it's, it's no longer – you know, run in and take care of the problem as fast as you can, unless you're put in that position. Um, it's more so, how do I get my guys home safe? You know, how do I, how do I give them what they need to, to be able to do the job? How do I, you know, make sure that, that everybody's uh, attitudes are good? You know, that, that kind of stuff. And what do I like about that? I think I like the fact that I have a chance to, you know, my management skill is more geared towards the family style, which works really well in fire departments. Mm. Um, you know, I, I've preached to a lot of guys that, you know, a lot of guys think, you know, you become fire chief and, and you're the guy that stands there and points a finger and yells at people. And it's like, it's not like that at all. You know, you're, you're the guy that stands there and looks, looks around to see what everybody needs. You know, you're the guy that, you know, it tries to be the glue to hold stuff together by the grace of God, you know? So, uh, I, I think I like the fact that that's a that family. I'm in a work environment where we can have that kind of family atmosphere. Mm. It sounds like it's similar to being a dad in a family. It is. It absolutely is. It's just a dad of a bunch of boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a bunch of teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to be a firefighter. I put that on my, yeah. you know, some little assignment. My mom showed me when I was a kid, cowboy or a firefighter. <laughs> Very good. Didn't work out that way. I think well. pretty much every kid used to be a firefighter when, I, when they're young, you know, at some point. But, yeah. you know, the funny part was I don't remember. I don't ever remember wanting to be a firefighter. I don't remember, you know, like, I can't wait to grow up to do this. Uh, when I was in the military, I had a buddy of mine that uh, he had joined a local volunteer fire department in Texas. And he was wearing one of these. It's a pager that we wear on our hip. This is how they tell us there's a fire. He had it on his hip, and and I said, "What's that?" And he told told me. And I'm like, "They let you do that?" He's like, "Yeah, come on down. You could do it too." I'm like, "Awesome!" So I went down and joined, you know. And I was on for like two weeks, and they hand me a check, you know, because there's uh, we got we're like part timers, you know, get paid by the hour. They hand me a check. And I'm like, I get paid for this too. <laughs> it was like. 
but it was never anything that I had forethought on. You know, I never really considered myself able to do something like that. So it's almost like you got into it accidentally. It sounds like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, in the Navy, guys in the Navy, in, in the Navy, they everybody has the base firefighting skills because you know you're you're, you're working and living on an island. You know, and if your island sinks, you no longer have an island to work or live on. So. They try to make sure everybody's got some kind of level of fire training. So that helped out, you know, get me that position. Yeah. When I was a 17 or 18, I did something that here in Canada, anyway, it's called the SYEP student youth employment program for the Naval reserve. So I joined the Navy to learn how, well, just a reserve and learned how to fight fires. Went out on this tiny diesel ship that I got so sick riding that thing, Lake Ontario, which I guess, not the same as the ocean. It would have been way worse than the ocean. Yeah, I wasn't cut out for it. You, what really turned me off of being in the military was target practice. Because we weren't shooting at bullseyes. We were shooting at like what looked like cutouts of Russian and German soldiers. I oh. thought, this is real. Like this is a, this is. I'm gonna have to some maybe someday put a bullet in someone's forehead. So just wasn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least you learn that before you get before you join. Yeah, that's right. It was a good experience just being in the the reserve thing. It was, uh, I really enjoyed things like um, drill. And my drill was sharp enough that I got to be in the honor guard or whatever with the white gloves and the, yeah. you know, that was fun. I loved everybody else snapping things too right at exactly the same time. And I guess that may be more the performance side of my heart as opposed to really any interest in killing things. I don't know. My I was, I love the drill as well. Uh, we had in our boot camp, we had what were called leggings and there are these white things that are about this big and you put them over your pants and over your boots and everybody could see it. Everybody knew that you were the, the company that had the leggings in boot camp and that you were, you know, leveled up or whatever. But they had a jingle to them, almost like a spur, like was your cowboy walks with the spurs on. And so as a company, when you're walking as a company and everybody's in step, you know, it's chink, chink, chink. Oh, that's just, cool. Yeah, except for that we had one guy that was never in step. So it was like chink, 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 chink. <laughs> I remember we had a few girls that couldn't get the arm motions right. So they'd always walk. I don't, I don't know. I don't think you guys have the same kind of marching as the Canadian soldiers have, but we have a way of keeping our arms straight and walking with our, you know, opposite to your legs. And there were yeah. some, some people who could, just couldn't get that. Didn't understand. It seems so easy. <laughs> we really like the Navy ships. Uh, we, uh, I was in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> so we, we actually built, I was on two different ships. One was, a, uh, both of them were minesweepers. And so they were smaller ships about the size of an ocean going tub. And so the second ship I was on, I actually commissioned it and we built it in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. So then we went around to the Sioux Locks and out, you know, around Nova Scotia. And when we hit Nova Scotia, we, we uh, moored up next to a naval, naval sh or a Canadian ship. And I just thought it was so cool because the Canadian ships are rounded on the corners versus our ships. And, uh, and the one guy says, well, you think that's good? Why don't you go over there? And there was a bar on the ship. I mean, you know, here I am, 19, 20 years old. And to me, that was just like, you got bars on your ship? This is great. <laughs> I was ready to sign up right then and there. <laughs> we didn't have a bar on the little ship that I was using. <laughs> but it certainly came to be a thing. Like, you know, I, w I was raised in the church when, and was brought up that, you know, drinking was a sin and smoking was a sin. And uh, all the other 18-year-olds and 17-year-olds in this group, they were all drinking all the time. They were heavy yeah. drinkers. That same, seems to be a thing with the Navy here. Is it the same in the States? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. I mean, they just, you know, it was part of what you did, you know. And yeah. funny part is you have to be 21 to drink here. But on base, you could drink at 18. And, yeah, just go out and get rip roaring drunk. That was what you did, you know. And, you know, a lot of the guys that I knew, you know, were – joined the military because they didn't have the best background you know what i mean and you know maybe not good father figures uh not not i'm not i'm generalizing no but that um, is the trope or that is the stereotype isn't it yeah so you found you it know, was a bit true right 
What's that? You did find that to be a bit true. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, what do you do when you when you don't know what true masculinity is? Well, you don't know what, you know, what it means to be a man. Well, you go out and you, you try to be as, as tough as the other guys, you know, and who can out drink who and, you know, who can out arm wrestle who and, you know, and that's, that's kind of, I don't know if it's changed, you know, that was 20 years ago, but, or 30 years ago, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's a real shocker, isn't it? To say, say something was 30 years ago and you realize you were 20, I was 24, 30 years ago. Yeah. It's nuts. It's absolutely. When I found out my 30th high school reunion was coming up, it was like, seriously, <laughs> what, what happened? So wow. we were just talking today, talking today at work about, uh, you know, I still in my mind feel like I'm 20. You know, I don't, and a lot of people say, well, I feel like I'm, you know, 12 in my mind. I don't feel like I'm 12. I feel like I'm about 20, you know, and my body feels like I'm about 40. Um, but, you know, sometimes I got to look at my ID card and remind myself, no, you're 50, you need to act your age. <laughs> yeah. I think I feel about 17 in my enthusiasm for life or my, my, I don't know. There's like a psychological thing, like 17, I think what it is, is maybe it's the age when you really start to, to realize you're less egocentric, maybe something happens and you realize there's other people looking at you and you have this identity that kind of crystallizes. Oh, yeah. I wonder if that's when you sort of get stuck at that age. I don't know. For me, it's about 17, but my body feels like it's about 60. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't know. So my, my parents were split when I was younger. So, the nice part was I had a dad, you know, I had a dad who loved me. I had a dad who, you know, did what he could for me. I just didn't live with him. So um, I'll take that over having a, you know, a completely absent dad or, or an abusive dad. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I still didn't really know because of, you know, the situation, didn't really know who, who Doug was, you know. So it took me a long, long time to figure out. I was out of the military and uh, I've always said that, you know, uh, between God and my wife, I finally grew up at some point, you know, because <laughs> I just really didn't have a lot of the building blocks, I think, that, that I needed. But, you know, again, it was a it was a grace thing that uh, I finally figured it out or as much as you can figure it out, I should say, because none of us none of us have it all figured out. Yeah. One of the things I really like about watching your channel is you often have some really insightful and thoughtful things to say, whether it be about marriage or maturity or grace, or, you know, experience, life experience. It's, obviously faith is important to you. You Have you been a Christian your whole life? Yeah. I, uh, I accepted Christ when I was like seven, I think. Um, having said that, you know, I was seven. So, you know, I didn't really truly understand how bad I could be. You know what I mean? Uh, so I had a lot of learning to do. And, of course, like I said, growing up and, you know, my uh, my mom had uh, or my there were several divorces, you know, throughout me growing up. And that kind of uh, added a little bit of the confusion and the, you know, the searching. And, and uh, I never... I never turned my back on on God or on the church, uh, but there were times in my life where I didn't go. Matter of fact, that's why I got out of the out of the Navy. Um, I was I was ready to re up in two weeks. I was going to sign up for another two years, and uh, I got I got out of my bunk, got dressed, and I'm walking through the ship. And I thought, and I don't even know what brought it up, but I thought to myself, you know, I can't think, I cannot remember, literally cannot remember the last time I prayed. And it just kind of like you're having us talk to yourself like, dude, that's, that's kind of serious, man. You know? And, uh, so I came home that day and I, I talked to my wife and I said, Hey, you know, what, what would you think if we got out? Cause I, you know, I, I really don't like who I've become. Mm -hmm. And it's not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the, you know, the Navy, you know, kicks the guy, kicks the Jesus out of you, you know, but yeah. uh, it just, it wasn't a very good a conducive environment for me at that time. <clears throat> for who I was. I'm like, well, you know, what do you say we get out and, and, uh, find a church and, and she's her comp. I don't know. forget. She looks at me. She goes, I don't care. Just make up your mind. 
<laughs> so I, I said, yeah, let's go. So uh, we got out and uh, uh, found a church and uh, we uh, still even then didn't have a strong faith. You know, I was a church goer. I sat in the back. I left as soon as I could. So I didn't have to talk to a lot of people. Uh, and I don't know if I ever talked about it on my channel, but my wife and I had a really rough patch in about 2007 to where I had filed for divorce and we were, you know, we were, I was going to go my separate way. Um, and we don't have no time on this, on this chat to talk about it, but, uh, it, it basically over a period of about three months, her and I both got our heads screwed on straight. Mm. And I think that for me was the, was the pinnacle of my faith. That was, I saw a guy that work a lot in, uh, in that time of my life, you know, doing things that could only be explained by, you know, by him. And, uh, so yeah, it's my, I'm not perfect by any means. I never pretend to be, but I will. Yes. My, my faith is very important to, to who I am. Yeah. So you, was your mom or your mom and your dad in the church or what at seven, what was it that introduced you to Jesus? At that point, my mom, my mom had already left or had divorced my dad. They divorced when I was about three. And then <clears throat> when I was about, I think I was, I must have been six or seven. Uh, my stepdad, who was, uh, he was very PTSD from Vietnam. So uh, we were all scared to death of him. You know, he's a big man and uh, very... I, I don't consider it as much PTSD as I do shell shock. And I know by the book definition, they're the same thing. But to me, shell shock is more violent. Okay. And uh, so he had more of those violent tendencies, more of the, you know, you couldn't wake him up because he, you know, jump at you and that kind of stuff, which I'm not saying that to get, you know, sympathy. It's just that's the kind of environment we're in. So uh, anyway, um, he had prayed one night. He wasn't a believer. And he had prayed one night that uh, if God, if you're real, then send somebody to me so that I know that you're real and this isn't just something. That night, we lived way out in the country. Our nearest neighbor was a mile down the road. Uh, that night, there was a knock on the door and there was two guys from the church. And they came in and uh, I don't remember, any, you know, I was, I was six, so I don't remember a whole lot of it. All I remember is you know, all these adults are sitting around talking and they're, they're explaining, you know, what it means to be a Christian and stuff. And uh, I remember asking the question, I said, they were talking about heaven. And I said, well, is, is heaven like Disneyland? Hmm. And the guy looked at me, I forget, the guy looked at me and he said, young man, heaven makes Disneyland look like a junkyard. And I was hooked. I was sold. I was like, winner. <laughs> you know, so that started the process of, you know, us going to church and, and getting involved there. Wow. So you must have had a real receptive and sensitive heart at age six. Tell me about that. Like, have you always been like that? So my mom, you know, I, I, I take after my mom a lot uh, with a lot of that stuff. And my mom, because of uh, my stepdad's tendencies, would always be the buffer between him and us. You know, if we'd screwed up, you know, she step in to kind of, you know, ease the blow a little bit. And, uh, she had a very, very servant, servant heart. And, uh, you know, so I took after her a lot when it came to that kind of stuff. Of course I was the baby too, you know, so I was emotionally spoiled, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, you know, you couple that with the fact that I was the only boy in the family. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I got a lot of the, the feminine side of how to deal with conflict, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, which I think is why, you know, why I had so much problem as a young man understanding who I was because I didn't have the same, you know, upbringing of this is how you shoot a gun and this is how you be a boy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, she, I took a lot of her, she taught me a lot of things and I always, I, I didn't want to say cursed it, but I always hated the fact that I was, I was soft. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, as I grew and as, as I matured, I realized that was more of a blessing than it was a curse. You know, I, I watched so many guys that, you know, through alcoholism or 
you know, rage or any of the, the problems that are, that males are prone to. Um, I don't struggle with it and have, usually haven't struggled with, with most of them. Um, I have my struggles, don't get me wrong, but uh, now I see it's a blessing because, you know, back to the fire chief thing, I use a lot of that conflict resolution in what I do. And it doesn't take yelling at somebody to get something fixed. You know, a lot right. of times it's just calling somebody in your office to sit them down and say, hey, you're not the same person you were yesterday. What's going on? And they open up to you, you know, so. Wow. That's, that's a real skill and gift. Not perfect, but. Well, nobody blessed, is. I guess. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice yeah. to. I think it's good to be valued for the skills that you do bring, right? No, no one is perfect, but that sounds like a real gift that you've got to be able to resolve conflict and be able to speak to guys like you're saying that are sometimes like overgrown teenagers and to be yeah. able to diffuse conflict, motivate people to, to, to work in the same, move in the same direction, work on the same project. That's great. How many kids do you have, Doug? I have one. He's 22. And uh, he sort of lives with us right now. <laughs> uh, we moved. We moved, and he's got a he's got a friend um, who he stays with a lot, and uh, so we see him on the weekends every now and then. Uh, but we're a real good, real good kid. Nice. And where are you originally from? Are you not originally from Michigan? No, I'm from Indiana. Uh, I grew up in Northern Indiana. Kind of moved all around Northern Indiana the northwest side of Indiana from Central to the west side. And then uh, when I met my wife, went, joined the military, she was from Michigan. So we only moved, you know, 45 minutes from where I was raised. So, uh, yeah, we we, uh, we stuck around pretty much the same area. It's just we're north of the line instead of south of the line, though. Right. Tell me where Indiana is. I, As a Canadian, I should know my geography in the States better, but... No, so <clears throat> Michigan, Lake Michigan, if you can, you know where Lake Michigan's at? Yeah. So Michigan is to the east of Lake Michigan. Indiana is directly below Michigan, like the eastern and western borders line up. Okay. It just goes straight, straight south from there. Yeah. I've been to a few, uh, a few different states, Washington state. I've been down to uh, Maryland and... Um, what's the place where everybody goes from Canada to go go to the beach? Uh, <sighs> south and north, something or other. Anyway, I've been, what? North Dakota. Oh, like Carolina. Yeah, yeah, right. And I've been to North Dakota and South Dakota, Oregon, Florida. Uh, oh, what's that place? I think it's just. Is it just east of Texas or just north of Texas? I was there for um, a Promise Keepers conference years and years ago. Hmm. I went to Promise Keepers. Yeah? Remember Promise Keepers? I do. I went to Detroit and uh, then when they did a stand of the gap in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I was there too. Were you really? Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, I, had uh, I still got the cup at work, the Promise Keepers mug. You know, that that was really quite the experience. What blew me away is my dad, I lived in New Jersey at the time, working at a church down there. And so all of us from the church, a bunch of guys, went to this Million Man March or whatever it was in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Is that the one you're talking yeah. about? And my dad was going to go, but he lived up here in Kingston, Ontario, which is three hours from Toronto. And I thought, well, I'm going to walk around there and see if I can find him. I only half listened the whole time I was there because I was walking around <laughs> trying to find my dad impossible <laughs> you don't realize how many a million men are until yeah, you're there yeah. you know that's a one lot of the, cool. one of the one of the coolest things in my life <clears throat> is after it was over and we're all leaving of course we're we're saturating the subway system we're saturating every transit that you know form of transit they have and we get into the subway and we're, you know, we're waiting, waiting there and you're shoulder to shoulder. Everybody's going in. Nobody's coming out. Yeah. And they start singing. Yeah. And so here you have thousands of men 
singing in the subway, Amazing Grace, and it's echoing down to the subway. And I'm just, the chills are just rolling, man. I mean, it was the coolest thing ever. It really was. Yeah, man. I remember we had over by us, I never saw it, but there was some protesters and the they were women who had taken their tops off and they were walking through the crowd. Basically, we're going to prove that you're men and, you know, uh, this Christianity stuff is all fake. And nobody groped, nobody, you know, the only people, that, the only guys that were like staring was like, what's going on, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then two guys came up behind him with a blanket and draped it over each of the girls. And I thought that was the coolest thing. You know, it's like this, this is what Christianity does. You know, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't accuse you. It doesn't, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't have the right, uh, the right, what am I trying to say, way of, of doing it, you know, but nobody attacked them. They just put blankets over them and, you know, hey, let me talk to you about Jesus. You know, and it was, it was a really cool thing. So. Yeah. My, our, we, we uh, rescued a, a stray cat and got her fixed. But first she had babies in our house. And so my daughter wanted to keep one of the babies and we kept the cat. But the thing is, this cat is still a stray. And so she's a major hunter. So I saw her running around the yard today with a dead gray squirrel. Or the, the thing wasn't dead. It was like trying to protest. Now the kitten is out there playing with it. So I don't know. You can see the cat in the background of the video of my, just over my, uh, what is that? My left shoulder. See it? There by the table. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a bunch of barn cats in the past because they keep the mice out of the barn. Oh yeah. But yeah, the uh, problem is that our dog likes to eat cats now. So really, <laughs> we stopped. Yeah, we stopped getting them until we get a new dog. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. I'll leave him alone. He can eat a mouse or a squirrel. <laughs> Oh, I can't keep my pipe so you, alive. You do a lot of music. I do. So one of my part-time jobs is I'm the worship director at my church. Um, I've been in, I've tried to make a career of music since I graduated from Bible college. I graduated from Bible college back in 91 or something and have worked as music directors in different churches. So okay. um, eventually we all got it. My wife and I kind of got tired of the worship wars that you experience, you know, you, I'm hired at a church to do music ministry and half the congregation loves me and the other half hates me. I miss the old hymns. Yeah. How come we're not doing hymns? And because I'm more of a contemporary guy, I was always hired to start the contemporary service or to, you know, make the service more contemporary. And so then I become public enemy number one, I guess. So we kind of got tired of that and we decided I, I started just working for myself basically full time doing I'm a computer programmer too. And I and we just volunteer or part time at churches and so on. I started when I was uh, volunteering at the local Anglican church, that's uh, Episcopal in the States. I was kind of blown away by the way they would follow the liturgy and the lectionary. So they would have scriptures that would be the same scriptures that are read in all of the churches that follow the lectionary. But instead of the pastor saying, you know what, this week I think I'm going to preach on First John. He just preaches on what's in the Bible, what's in the lectionary for that day, and all the churches are. And I thought, that's such a unifying thing. And so uh, I started writing music to go with the lectionary, putting the various scriptures to music. And we, after we were okay. there six or seven years, we moved to a new church, but... Um, still had a passion for putting scripture to music. So now I've, I've been able to get um, all of the Psalms put to music and Ephesians and Philippians, and most of Galatians, chunks of other books like John and Habakkuk and stuff like that. Now do you play any instruments? Uh, yeah, I play, I play drums, bass, guitar, piano, keys, trumpet, flute, pretty Just much. The worship leader. Yeah, much, you put an instrument in my hands, and within five or ten minutes, I'll be playing it. Just, <laughs> Very just good. A, a weird I gift. I wanted to be like, I always told my wife, I said, you know, I don't play the lottery, but if I ever were to win, I'm going to have one room off my house that's got every instrument I can think of, and I'm going to hire some guy named Hector 
who's on at my beck and call and it's like at two o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep. Hey Hector, come teach me how to play the banjo. <laughs> well, if you ever win the lottery, just hire me. Is it okay? I'll change my name to Hector and then I can step a pipe with you while I'm teaching you how to play. There you go. That'll work. <laughs> I also teach music. I, uh, I teach all those instruments. That's what, I guess what I'm, you know, why I often can't join in the lives on Monday and Tuesdays because I'm teaching. That makes sense because I heard you said something about teaching and I was trying to figure out what you're teaching. But yeah. Yeah. I get, my problem is I'm a tinkerer. So, you know, I've got, I've got a banjo, I've got a, uh, octave mandolin guitar, uh, three different ukuleles, harmonica, penny whistle, uh, piano. But I go through phases where it's like, you know, okay, I want to play this instrument. Okay. Now, now I want to play this instrument and I'll forget what I learned on this instrument. You know what I mean? So, I've really been enjoying probably over the last two years, the, the ukulele though. I, I think I've finally landed on that. Um, I started off the soprano and like so much the tenor. Yeah. Uh, and then once I got the tenor this Christmas, my wife bought me a, a baritone and mm. it's a, just a beautiful, you know, he's not what you would think, you know, I've never played a baritone on ukulele. Yeah, it's it, it, and it's tuned like a guitar. It's, it's tuned at like the top four strings of a guitar. Right. Yeah. But the bottom string isn't high like on a soprano, right? It's low. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. That's, yeah. I've played a, that's the same way the tenors are tuned, right? If not, then think, okay. Well, then I have played a baritone. I think the, tenors, the sopranos are tuned the same. Okay. And you can you can. So what I did was the soprano. And the tenors are tuned with a high string on the on the the bottom string. Yeah. And, but you can tune them with a low string on the bottom string. Right. So my soprano has a high string, my tenor has a low string, mm. and then my baritone is tuned like the guitar. Nice. Yeah, I I, I like ukulele, and it's a, I often recommend that um, when kids come to me and they want me to teach them guitar, I often will say to the parents, let's start off with ukulele there's yeah. all four strings the chord shapes are all the same they have different names but it's fairly easy once you've learned these shapes so. yeah. yeah yeah and they're smaller for little fingers yeah exactly i wish you know i played guitar for a while and uh i just you know it's easier if you can keep the calluses up when you're playing it all the time um but i just never was able to get past like the power chords you know just because my fingers just didn't seem to work like that with the yeah. with the ukulele it seems so much more natural and it i'm sure it's because it's easier you know but uh just you know, it's such a soft and that's what i look look for in most of my music is that soft you know i just want to sort of like a pipe i just want to relax with this this is my yeah. relaxation time you know what I mean? yeah that's how i am too with music mm, that's neat yeah, I love music. I think pipe smoking and music go together really well. Yeah, you know, you know, I when I uh, put this room together, I brought an Echo Dot down because I figured I'd come down here and listen to music while I'm smoking my pipe, and I hardly ever do. I should do it more. I can tell you, I don't listen to classical very often, but when I do, I love listening to like Yo-Yo Ma and the cello, and that's the one thing I have done now is, is listen to. Uh, I, I just say Alexa play music based on Yo-Yo Ma, you know, and um, right. but I'm, I'm surprised how little I use it. I mean, part of it's because I'm usually either studying or I'm uh, going through YouTube videos. So I'm, I'm assuming you're not going to Chicago. Oh, there's a pipe show, right? Is that what this is about? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a long way for me to go. Is it? How far is it from you? <sighs> Probably a good 10 hours or better, isn't it? Yeah, I bet you it would be. So to Detroit, it would probably be eight hours. How far yeah. is it from Detroit to Chicago? Detroit. Probably more like four, so right? From Michigan, are you east or west from Michigan? Uh, I am from Michigan. I am east. Oh, yeah, it's probably 15 hours or better. Well, I say that like I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, it's another six hours from Detroit. Yeah. It's, it's about two hours from me, but I'm on the west, north or southwest corner. Chicago's like, I'm here, 
you go around the lake and Chicago's here. Right. I've driven to Chicago once when Joanne and I first met, we got married pretty fast too. We, we had been dating long enough that we just knew when we met each other that this we're done with the shopping around. We'll make, we're going to make it work eight months. Yeah. And got married. We knew each other for eight months, but uh, I didn't want to marry her until she'd met my parents. She was from the West uh, North of North Dakota and I am from the East North of New York state. So it's about a 48 hour drive, a 50 hour drive. And so we drove it, but we went through the States because the gas is a bit cheaper when you go through the States. It's a little bit longer, but we went through Chicago. Oh my goodness, the roads in Chicago. There was, you had to be careful not to disappear into a pothole. Yeah, yeah. That and, that and everybody wants to do 70 miles an hour bumper to bumper. Yeah, so, oh my goodness. The, the funny part is you said that about eight months. It was eight months for my wife and I. No way. We met on her birthday, January 26th. We got married September 30th. I mean, 30 years later or 31 years later, you're still going strong. Yep. Yeah. I've never been better. You know, yeah. a lot of people say that, but, you know, I really mean it. I mean, we, we still have our moments and we're both, um, we're both type A personalities. Oh. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot. I think uh, Jason from uh, NW Piper said it the best. We do a lot of loud fellowship. <laughs> you know, a lot, but you know, there are times in our house when there's some loud fellowship, you know. Um, but uh, we, you know, we can, we get through it now. You know, we get through it with uh, uh, much quicker and much less attitude now where it's like, no, I don't agree. No, I don't agree. Okay. Let's figure it out. All right. All right. Let's move on. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Joanne and I are both pretty laid back personalities. I probably, I lean a little bit more to the type A. I like to be doing things, but she does too in that respect. She's not happy to just sit around. Um, oh, yeah. But we're laid back as far as, I don't, I don't even know how to describe our personalities. Where we don't, we don't mind going to bed at 830 and watching TV and turning off the light at can and you know it's like we live a boring life in that respect but we both like people we like to socialize but limited amounts we're both introverts so we get tired when we hang around with people for too long um oh, yeah. her more so than me i'm a little bit more near the center so i and i'm finding as i get older i'm more and more energized by people and i do really like to be especially in one-on-one -on -one like this you know meeting new people mm -hmm. getting to know them trying to ask them questions that you know that shows that i'm interested in who they are and get to you know i really enjoy that i really like all these interviews i've been doing with you guys it's just been really fun for me yeah one of the i know there's some controversy behind it which i'm not going to talk about because it's behind everybody now but when nw when jason from nw piper did his one giveaway he asked some deep 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 questions and controversy aside, I couldn't, I mean, I told him, like, dude, I think you broke the YTPC because it was such, guys are really having to think about these questions. I don't even know what the questions were now. Mm. Um, I missed all that. But had, oh, man, it was it was just wonderful. Uh, there was some side stuff that, that's like I say, there's some controversy happening on the side. I say that as, as kind of a flag that if you hear that, don't worry about that. I don't want to ruin the whole thing because the the – Aside from that, this whole thing with what with what the questions he asked were just you couldn't just say, yeah, this is my favorite pipe and I like Carter Hall. You know, OK, now I'm in the giveaway. It was uh, something about your legacy or something like that. There were three mm -hmm. questions and they were good, good questions. And I love that. I love those Thank you. those thinking type questions. You know, we're not not, you know, we're not all Einstein's, but to be able to have a conversation deeper than what's my favorite tobacco and what's my favorite pipe. You know, yeah. uh, I hear a lot, a lot of guys talk a lot about, you know, my, my friends on the YTPC you guys are my friends. And, and, you know, I, I agree with that. I agree. I consider a lot of guys friends on the YTPC, but I also know that friendship is deeper than we share a like in one thing. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm completely with you. I am really not interested in going on the YTPC to hear people talk about their reviews of the latest tobacco that's come out or, you know, different types of pipes and stuff. That's not why I smoke a pipe. I smoke a pipe because a pipe lends itself to in, uh, introspection. It slows you down. This is something that requires a peaceful moment, really encourages you to think. These are the types of people that I want to know. And I, I, yeah. if lots of people don't like my channel because I don't do any tobacco reviews, well, I don't want those people on my channel anyway. I mean, if they're here and they like it, yeah. great. But that's not who I'm attracting. That's not who I'm interested in. I'm interested in the thinkers. You know, the, think about all the stereotypical pipe smokers that we know, like Albert Einstein or C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien. These are interesting people who like to think, the philosophers, right? Yeah, yeah. And I always feel like a... You know, I, I don't know if you saw, I, I just posted recently about C.S. Lewis and there's a, a YouTube channel, something like C.S. Lewis Essays or something. Wonderful. It's broken up anywhere from like a five minute to a 35 minute uh, video. And, and really it's audio because it's a picture, but of, of narration of his writings and just super deep thoughts. And at first when I was listening to these things, I hadn't moved yet and I had like a 40 minute drive to work. And I remember thinking to myself, it's like, man, I really want to get into C.S. Lewis, but I'm a mental midget compared to him. You know, I, I can't, I can't follow him, you know? And, yeah. and so finally I just kind of had this talk with myself of, so don't get it all. Yeah. You know, it's like, if you go to a feast and you don't get to eat everything, it doesn't mean you don't go to the feast, you know? <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so, yeah. so I've been, I've been listening to, to these and no, I don't get it all, but his, his points are so deep mm -hmm. that it just makes you sit back. I've sat back before and paused it or missed the, the rest of it because I was thinking about one point that he made because mm -hmm. he makes his point so well. There's a really good YouTube channel that I'll link in the description called YouTube, I mean, uh, C.S. Lewis Doodles. Have you seen that one? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, where they're writing a picture while he's talking? He draws a picture, sort of high speed yeah. and little stick figures and stuff and kind yeah. of lays it all out visually, whether you're listening or not. But I find some of his concepts are kind of heady and deep, but seeing the little picture mm -hmm. drawn helps me connect the dots a bit. And I'm like, okay, yeah, wow. Yeah, I have seen those. And I, they're the same. I think the, the channels are pretty much the same thing. Yeah, I've seen your channel too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. The guy was just amazing. Um, you know, and I, I stopped short of idolizing him. Right. And, you know, I, <laughs> I think I've been through down that lane of my life too, where, you know, I, I put so many people up on pedestals and then watch them topple over and wonder what the problem was that yeah. I don't do that, you know, but, uh, I will say he was a truly, truly blessed man to be able to communicate, to have the thoughts one, and then to be able to communicate them like he did. Just amazing. Yeah. And I love it that he comes from the position of a former atheist. So he makes, I'm reading right now a book by his called uh, Mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. He outlines from the beginning, okay, so why is it that we have all these laws? We call them the laws of nature, like the law of gravity or the law, whatever. But everything is forced to obey these laws. But there's a different law that humans all feel the law that we should obey. We, sh we should follow a certain, what's the word he uses for it? The fact that our conscience responds to when we do wrong or that we get upset when other people do wrong against us. The fact that we have an O-U-G-H-T, an ought, we ought to do this. The fact that everybody yeah. has that, whether or not they believe in God, that must mean that there's some other law. We're not, we're not actually forced to obey that law, but we all feel like we should. Why? And so yeah. he builds that and he kind of takes you through a whole journey of coming to this idea that that's because there's a creator. And it's amazing. It's, it's a really good sort of case for Christ, you know? Uh, yeah, he, he did a great job with that. And I, you know, I, I call it deduction because, you know, we have uh, in the fire service, we have meters where we go in. Somebody will have a carbon monoxide issue 
is we'll take this meter in to see if they have carbon dioxide in the house. And it actually checks four different gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, hydrogen, I don't know. It's anyways, there's four different gases it checks. And when we go in, I tell the guys, I'm like, don't just wait to see if the carbon monoxide alarm goes off. Watch the monitor because the air that you and I breathe is 21% oxygen. If, and I tell them, I'm like, if when you walk in there and that oxygen drops from 21% to 15% or 16% and there's nothing else going off, that's telling you something's taking the place of that oxygen. Mm. So there's a deduction there that you have to make. You can't just play dumb and wait for this thing to alarm out. And that's what I think C.S. Lewis does so well is that he doesn't say, well, go to this mountain and God will be there waiting on you. You know, and you'll see him and you'll know he's real. And this is how you know there's a God. No, he says, look, look to your point, you know, even though the A, B and C happen, you're still thinking and feeling D. Mm. And you're still you still know that there's something not quite right about what you're seeing. There's a reason for and, and helping you deduct that in a way that doesn't sound like, well, I don't feel like it. So it's, it must be true you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um he does a really good job of, and deduction is the only, is the best word I can think to, to describe it. It's a good word for it. Yeah. Deductive reasoning. It's taking you through this, yeah. sort of the steps of it. Wow. I, would, I absolutely would love to have been a student of his. It seems yeah, like I was you never have a natural student. aptitude for speaking. Have you ever, do you speak at your church regularly or? Oh, well, do I? Yeah. No, I, I did um, the church that we had two churches ago. Uh, we had time. So we do communion every weekend, every Sunday. And before communion, the de I was a deacon at the time. The deacons would get up and take turns speaking at the table. And it was basically a mini two-minute sermon. And uh, I, I so enjoyed that because I'm a... Um, analogy type guy i like to i like to compare things and you know i mean you see now you got the whole series of analogies on faith right uh, but i i loved to do that because to put the pieces of the puzzle together to put you know scramble something up and then lay it back out is one thing and that's fun right mm -hmm. what's even better or more fun than that to me or more satisfying is a better word is the same reason why i teach is that to see the light bulbs go off when you lay that out. Mm. When you see people raise their eyes, they're like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. You know, it's like, good, got through to them. You know, they're listening, they've learned something. They're better, they're a better person walking out of here than they were than, you know, when I first saw them. You know, not yeah. because I made them that way, but because we were able to together come to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. God it's used been enjoyable. It's a real it's really fulfilling to know that God is able to use you to to touch people. It's part of the reason I love to do worship music at church is it, it's such a, it's a, such, it's so fulfilling to see the impact that my gift being used for God has on people. It was a real challenge through COVID because we were playing to an empty church and still trying mm -hmm. to lead worship and, and um, encourage those watching home <laughs> on YouTube to have some sort of a worship experience there on their couch. That was a real challenging time. With no feedback at all. Not No, well, certainly not um, at the moment. We might hear afterwards. Yeah. Well, we really enjoyed that service or, yeah. Yeah, good, because I couldn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's probably a good place to end it. This has gone a long time. I hope people don't mind that we've talked so long. I've really enjoyed it. Me too, man. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it greatly. So can we uh, continue to connect even if we don't do this over YouTube? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm game. I wish for that sure. I could make it down to Chicago or maybe sometime I'll get to Michigan. I'm I'm thinking about taking my uh, music on the road at some point, maybe resigning at my church job and my wife and I just going on tour around to different churches that want me to sing scripture songs for them. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool. I might, yeah. I might make it to your church. I was going to say, look me up, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. Let's hope you already have seen me and talk or talking to me. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you have a nice evening. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you. Have a good night, man. You too. Talk to you later. 